president and chief executive officer of the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. As most of you know, the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council was started in 1995 in Washington, D.C. So this year we're celebrating our 25th anniversary and we have operations in Washington and in Ukraine. And we uh, worked very hard to make Ukraine a better place to do business and also promoted as a Ukraine place to do business. This is the second of our webinars to talk about independence. Two weeks ago, we had one on Ukraine's independence and uh, how it developed over the last 29 years. Today, we're talking about how to move Ukraine's independence forward. Independence is kind of a flexible word. It can mean a lot of different things, but for Ukraine, it means uh, to be a strong nation economically and to protect its uh, territory and to have democratic institutions and to practice uh, all of those uh, basic features of a strong nation in order to be uh, a major player in the world's uh, uh, League of Nations. So today we're talking about how to move Ukraine forward, how to fight to build a much stronger and viable independent Ukraine. Everyone in this room has been involved with Ukraine for a long time. I think all of us thought by 2020 we would have a stronger, more viable nation. But of course, there's always ups and downs and there's there's things that happen. And then there's Mr. Putin. And so there's all kinds of things that have uh, have uh, affected Ukraine's uh, movement to be a stronger nation. But uh, in the major downturns, there's always been major upturns, and there's been several revolutions. And so Ukraine is moving forward, and it's still democratic, but it still has a long ways to go. So today we're going to talk about how do we make Ukraine a more viable and stronger nation? What can be done in several different areas? Who can do it? How do we work uh, so that uh, five years from now and 10 years from now, Ukraine will be considered a much stronger, viable nation uh, in terms of uh, its perspective in the world and also for its citizens. Today, we have very uh, distinguished people who have been involved in Ukraine for a long time. First, we have uh, Vladimir Yelchenko, the ambassador. He's been a part of the Foreign Service uh, the diplomatic corps of Ukraine for over 30 years and spent a lot of time at the United Nations. So he's very familiar with this whole road uh, to independence. David Kramer, a senior fellow at Florida International University. David's been involved in several capacities. Alexa Trapisky is advisor to the Minister of Economic Development and Trade. And then Roman Kocher, uh, alternative director at the World Bank and IMF. We are... We do have to say that uh, uh, the Minister of Economic Development uh, sends his regrets, but the Prime Minister called yesterday and they're going on a trip outside of Ukraine. So he had to, uh, he had to go with the Prime Minister and he, he says, uh, expresses his regrets, he could not be here. But uh, uh, we understand. So let's move on now with the Ambassador. The Ambassador... Uh, You've been involved over 30 years. You spent a lot of time at the uh, United Nations. You've been uh, ambassador to Austria, ambassador to uh, to Russia. So I don't sure there's anybody any better to talk about uh, nation building and how you move ahead. So let's start out with your viewpoints. Uh, from your perspective, uh, how do we build a stronger, more viable uh, Ukrainian nation as we move forward. Ambassador, thank you very much. This is the second web webinar be, you've been on, so now we turn it over to you. Mr. Ambassador. Well, thank you very much, Morgan. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you uh, at this virtual event organized by our good friends and partners from US Ukraine Business Council. As we are challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, unfortunately, we are not able to see each other in person, but I'm confident that uh, our virtual discussion today will bring positive outcomes anyway. 
The topic of today's discussion cannot be chosen better, as we all are strongly united by the intent to act together to move Ukraine forward and to make it stronger, more successful and prosperous. The history of Ukraine is an example that there is no threat that can stop Ukrainian people's desire for freedom and independence, for economic well-being and development, for the respect of fundamental human rights and freedoms. Only during the 20th century, our land was devastated by the Bolsheviks' armed takeover of independent Ukrainian state, by Stalin's genocide of man-made hunger, Holodomor of 1932-33, that took millions of lives, by whirlwinds of the Second World War, by the deportation of Crimean Tatars. And the beginning of the 21st century was marked by a Russian war against Ukraine that started in 2014 and continues until today. And by the ongoing illegal occupation of Crimea and parts of Donbass. But strength and perseverance are in the core of the Ukrainian character. Over the centuries, Ukrainians have struggled for the freedom of their homeland and their right to chart their own destiny as a sovereign nation, free from foreign oppression or interference. Generations of Ukrainians have been tempered both in our mind and soul, and their will for freedom cannot be defeated. Ukraine has, a, uh, Ukraine has reasserted its independence almost three decades ago, but as you all know, our fight continues. As our forefathers knew that one day Ukraine will once again become an independent sovereign state, there is no question in our minds that Ukraine will prevail against the Russian aggression, will restore its full control over all of its territory, including Crimea, and will succeed as a strong and prosperous democratic European nation. Over the 29 years of Ukraine's independence, people have been longing for real changes. And in the past 12 months, which have been unprecedented for the entire world, Ukraine went through major transformations. Despite the COVID-19 outbreak, Ukraine has managed to maintain financial stability and continues on its path of comprehensive reforms and solidifying the conditions for sustained economic growth and development. The proactive response of the Ukrainian government to the challenges of the pandemic will mitigate its impact on our economy, while the improved business climate and new opportunities for growth will create a solid base for recovery. As a response to economic shock caused by the COVID-19 outbreak, Ukraine introduced a comprehensive stimulus package with policy measures implemented across three main categories, businesses, individuals, and monetary response. Business climate improvements in Ukraine built up the growth potential of our country. We continue our work on further progress in reform implementation, in particular in public governance, in public finance, business climate, financial and energy sectors. A number of important legislative acts have been adopted, namely the law on the land market and the law on banking sector, in order to widen the opportunities to make Ukraine the best destination for doing business. I will not go deep into the details of the economic aspects uh, as we are starting our discussions and I will be open to any of the questions from the audience. And I'm pretty sure that that Roman Kacher, who has much better knowledge uh, of economy, including the Ukrainian economy, will, will add uh, to our discussion. Uh, I would just like to stress that continued, uh, the continued support of the international community, especially of the United States of America, in our reforms efforts and our path to eradicate corruption will help Ukraine to become a full-fledged member of European and transatlantic community. 
The course towards becoming a nation free of corruption, a true Western style diplomacy, a nation of freedom and the rule of law has been set once and for all during the revolution of dignity. And we will never stop, uh, and we will never step down from this course. This year has brought a lot of important lessons for all of us and underscored the importance of mutual support in the face of the challenges we have ahead of us. Events like today's discussion helps us, help us to join our efforts and see how we can best address these challenges together. So I would like to once again thank the organizers and personally you, Morgan, and all the participants. In closing, I would like to bring your attention to a short video of the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, about hidden potential of our country and the variety of opportunities that Ukraine can open. Thank you for your attention. And now you will see the video. than anywhere else. Together, we can feed the world. Hurry up. The biggest country in Europe is the next big thing. Ukraine now is something we can do and benefit together. The whole world can prosper with Ukraine now. Thank you once again. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. It's been great to uh, to work with you now for uh, about eight months. When you came down from New York to be the ambassador in Washington, we were lucky to have several important uh, events with you in January and February before this crisis hit, and we look forward to getting back with those uh, events. And so thank you for your strong support, uh, particularly for the business community. It's very important that... Uh, that we all work together. So now let's move on to Alexa. We uh, Two of the areas that uh, are most important in building a strong nation is to build a strong economic system and to have a strong business community. All of us have saying here now for several months, the best way to offset Mr. Putin is to have a strong and growing economy in Ukraine. And the best way to keep the United States and Europe involved is to have reforms and to have a strong economy. So we're talking about building a strong economic system. We're also doing it through private enterprise to have a better private enterprise system with property rights and all the benefits that go mm -hmm. along with building private enterprise. Alexa has uh, dedicated her life to international work. She was an international journalist for several years. She uh, was the uh, uh, works with the Aspen Institute. She's executive director of the Ukraine House Davos, which is designed to attract international investors and international businesses to Ukraine. She's now deputy chair of the supervisory board of Ukraine Invest, which is to bring international investors in Ukraine. And she started her own group, Transnational Education Group, uh, to work with uh, outstanding students in Ukraine to uh, show them what the world's all about and to help them become world citizens. So Alexa, thank you. This is the second webinar you've been on and your main job now seems to be to attract a lot of uh, major international businesses and even some new startups into investing in Ukraine, which we know is just absolutely critical to the future of Ukraine to bring in more investment, to create better jobs. So Alexa, talk to us about how we're gonna get the international business community to help make Ukraine a stronger and better nation. 
It's an honor to be here with you today, alongside distinguished panelists who I greatly respect, Mr. Ambassador Morgan, David, Roman. Thank you for the invitation, Morgan. And on behalf of Minister Petrashko, he was very much looking forward to being here with you today. As Morgan mentioned, he is on a last minute business trip with the Prime Minister. I'd like to talk today about success stories. Specifically, I'd like to give a snapshot of key success stories from the last three months alone during COVID, of wins from the FDI perspective, what's been accomplished and where Ukraine is headed, and then talk a little bit about Ukraine country perception and key positive indicators and trends. And to set this up, first I'd like to kick off with this illustrative investment promotion video that was debuted in Davos this past January at Ukraine House Davos. Denis, if you could kindly Roll the video. I apologize, I didn't hear any, any audio on that. I, I don't know if other people did, but in short, by focusing on its long-term strengths, Ukraine can benefit during these times of uncertainty. And Ukraine has some big wins from the summer that illustrate this. These strengths include tech and innovation, IT outsourcing and solutions, global scale food production, and substantial engineering and manufacturing experience. These strengths coupled with highly skilled workforce low costs and exchange rate stability have improved the conditions for foreign trade and investment. Now tech and innovation, it's a favorite topic, lots of potential for growth. As you know, IT is the second largest export service industry in Ukraine. There are more than 100 global tech companies that have their R&D centers located in Ukraine, from Siemens, Google and Oracle to Samsung and Ring. Uh, Mercedes and BMW, the software for infotainment systems in world-class vehicles, it's developed by Ukrainian IT companies, among them Intellias, Global Logic, Looksoft, and stepping back among the world's most valuable unicorns are companies with Ukrainian roots. Revolut, which has a company valuation of $5.5 billion, TransferWise at 5 billion, GitLab at 2.7 billion, 
and Grammarly and Bitfury both valued at 1 billion US dollars. So Ukraine continues down its path to becoming a world major tech powerhouse. This summer, in fact, it ranked within the top 30 IT startup ecosystems globally for the first time by Startup Blink. So the country has the capacity to create the tech giants of tomorrow with significant factors being strong tech education, a massive talent pool, and a thriving startup ecosystem. At the same time, there are challenges. And according to the WEF, some of the top challenges to the Ukrainian tech industry are legal systems and judicial reform and in intellectual property. Now, capital investment in Ukraine's economy shrank by 35% in the first half of the year compared to January through June of 2019. This is according to the State Statistics Service and Ukraine Business News. At the same time, however, this year's drop in GDP, estimated at minus 5.7%, will be canceled by next year's growth, predict the experts at ICU in Kyiv. And as you know, the president has set a goal of attracting $50 billion in foreign direct investment over five years. Um, I'd like to just give a brief snapshot now of investment wins over the last three months, starting with the tech industry. The European Investment Bank has signed an absolutely unprecedented for Eastern Europe loan agreement for 50 million euros to Ukraine's first vertically integrated innovation park, Unit City in Kiev. Restream, despite the collapse of technolo technology valuations, Ukrainian startup Restream a service that allows the broadcasting of live video to 30 plus social networks at the same time. It raised $50 million by a pool of investors that were led by the leading Sapphire Ventures out of Palo Alto and Insight Partners out of New York. Restream is the world's largest distribution service for live video broadcasts. Uh, another win, Spotify is now coming to Ukraine. These content platforms entering Ukraine validate the ecosystem for, consu for consumer discretionary spending. It also shows that Ukraine's digital piracy barrier to entry, I would say, is slowly being overcome. Great news. Spotify is a major content platform, as you know, which may enable Ukraine content creators with the ability to promote Ukrainian culture globally as Ukraine can now consume and promote its own media on equal terms as the major US content creators. Another tech win, the video game developer 4A Games. It's the maker of the popular game series Metro. It was acquired this summer by Sweden's Embracer Group for $36 million with options for another 35 million if it meets agreed upon targets in the next five years. Metro was a pioneer in the Ukraine game industry and that acquisition shows the maturation of the Ukrainian tech industry. Uh, I would say from kind of a tech outsourcing hub to a recognized talent hub in and of itself as global companies start to pay acquisition premiums for Ukraine brand value. And by the way, lastly on tech, the government has created e-residency and immigration quotas for IT specialists, another recent win. Moving on to the media industry, Jean-Claude Van Damme was filming in Kiev this summer for the first Made in Ukraine Netflix movie. So while smaller films were seen as niche and supported by the diaspora and indie film festivals, Netflix moving into Ukraine creates market validation that Ukraine is capable of doing a serious film, feature film production, which is great news. Uh, commodities, Kernel became the first major company this summer to export 8 million tons of grain it's a major accomplishment given COVID and all the runoff, runoff effects from COVID. And a 63% year over year jump, as you know, is a major accomplishment in the commodity space. Most agriculture companies are hurting given the state of the hospitality industry. Concessions, very briefly. The first Qatari direct investment, I know Roman is probably going to speak more in depth on this, but the first Qatari direct investment into Ukraine, Q Terminals, it's a $124 million port project to develop and operate Olvia, which is a port on the Black Sea. This makes the second major port operator in Ukraine following Dubai ports entry into the country. Um, another deal, Ukraine and Turkey's joint venture agreement with Antonov. Co-production possibilities show that Ukrainian technology is valuable 
despite the COVID-related recession in civil aviation equities. And a final example, in July, the privatization of Kiev's Dnipro Hotel. Uh, this was a milestone for global investors who've been waiting for over six years, I think, for the state property fund to privatize key state assets. The hotel was snapped up for $41 million, although the starting price, I believe, was around $3 million. The buyer of Kiev's Dnipro Hotel plans to invest another $20 million to make it the world's first esports ready hotel. They want to make Kiev the mecca of world esports, which I understand is a $2 billion a year industry. And I think it's noteworthy to mention that Dmitro Sanichenko, the head of the state property fund, a man I greatly respect, he rejected this year a combined, in two instances, a combined $5.8 million in bribes. And he got the bribe proposers arrested. I say this to illustrate that this is the new generation. It's the new Ukraine. And we should be singing these stories, these success stories for the rooftops. For some reason, I only read this story in Ukrainian media as opposed to the Western press. And finally, very briefly, moving on to country perception, the closely watched international indexes agree. Uh, for example, World Bank's Doing Business 2020 report, Ukraine jumped seven spots from last year to a number 64 ranking this year. This is its highest ranking ever. In the Global Innovation Index, Ukraine is number 45, ahead of Brazil and India. It's a jump from last year. And within that index, this was interesting for me, for females employed with advanced degrees, Ukraine is number three. Finally, in the best ranked economies by income group, so Ukraine for its low, lower middle income economy bracket, Ukraine ranks number two, ahead of India and the Philippines and behind only Vietnam. Finally, the World Justice Project's rule of law ranking, Ukraine is number 72, up six places from last year. And I can say that Western investors, the Western investors I've been interfacing with over the last months have been very receptive and positive toward giving Ukraine a look, many for the very first time, as they seek to build diversity and resiliency into their strategic plans and their supply chains, et cetera, given the new global realities. Um, in conclusion, on the FDI note, Ukraine Invest this fall plans to unveil its investment guide to the country's top investment projects. It's a very useful tool, uh, so please monitor the website and social media for its publication in the coming weeks. It's a great team at Ukraine Invest, and in fact, I'd just like to mention it was voted among the top five investment promotion agencies across the Emerging Europe region recently by Emerging Europe magazine. So. Congratulations to the team. Thank you, Morgan. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Alexa. Uh, there's no question that all of us, uh, particularly in the business community, have got to work uh, uh, better and stronger uh, uh, with the EU and the United States and with all the international development banks uh, to move Ukraine forward on the economic scene. We've got to get economic growth up to five, six, seven, eight percent. Uh, just critical for better jobs, for stopping exodus of uh, the brain drain, and to improve the economic and overall strength of Ukraine. It's just, again, very important. Will you understand it? I understand it. A lot of folks understand it. We keep thinking that the uh, all the politicians and the government people should understand it. But there's multiple agendas in Ukraine sometimes, and sometimes business doesn't get to stay at the top. So we have to continue to fight. It's a battle every day and every week to keep the uh, economy going and to attract international investors. Mm -hmm. David, you've been with the State Department as an Assistant Secretary for Democracy. You've been president of Freedom House. You're with the German Marshall Fund. You've been with the McCain Institute and human rights and democracy. So you've been at the forefront of all this territorial integrity issue. You've been at the forefront of democracy and how you build strong democratic institutions, uh, in a, particularly in a place like Ukraine where they didn't have any. So let's start out with territorial integrity. Probably the biggest shock of 29 years has been with Mr. Putin orchestrated the invasion of Ukraine. 
And as you know, it's been going on and on and on. And now we have the, uh, the deal in Belarus. Everybody's concerned about what that's going to happen. So again, the biggest shock to Ukraine's independence has been territorial integrity. Talk to us about that, uh, the threat that is to the Ukrainian democracy and what Ukraine, with the support of the United States and the EU, should be doing more to, uh, to uh, protect Ukraine's territorial integrity. David? Well, Morgan, thanks very much. Thanks for uh, inviting me. And it's great to be with the ambassador and Alexa and Roman as well, uh, and with your, your viewers. Um, the title of the session is Moving Ukraine's Independence Forward, Building a Much Stronger and Viable Independent Nation. And I think Ukraine has done uh, a pretty amazing job of that over the past 29 years, obviously with some serious bumps along the way. Um, those include the two revolutions in 2004, 2014, and as you said, um, Russia's invasion of the country and continued occupation of Ukrainian territory. And that obviously poses uh, arguably the biggest uh, obstacle to Ukraine's forward development. But you also mentioned Belarus, Morgan, and I do want to start there by saying that what happens in Belarus is very important for Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians, I think, can relate to the desire of a population who want to free themselves from corrupt authoritarian rule, who want to take the country backward, who want to increase a country's dependence on Russia rather than reduce it. And that's what we've seen in Minsk and throughout towns and cities in Belarus. And I think Ukrainian support for that cause, for the cause of freedom, is very important. I know Ukraine also faces a challenge from the pandemic and closing its borders to reduce the potential surge of infections. At the same time, I hope that Ukraine will make exceptions for Belarusians who need to flee their country because of attacks from Lukashenko's forces. And that will remain, I think, a critically important way for Ukraine to contribute to keep the door open to, to Belarusians who have no choice but to flee for their own safety and for, the, for their lives. But the, it, standing with Latvia and Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, and other key EU member states is really important as the people of Belarus go through an excruciating battle to try to bring democracy and freedom to their country. There are also two other things I want to mention before coming back to the threat from Putin, and that is corruption, where Ukraine needs to do a better job. I don't, you don't need me to tell you that. Um, that would be better for companies who are members of the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. It would be better for Ukraine itself to see a, a, a huge spike in foreign direct investment. And this dealing with corruption, I think, is one of the biggest internal challenges the country faces. And I hope that it will get more serious in, in this way and, and stay committed on this path. The other is, is democracy um, and civil society. We're here too. I think Ukraine needs to do a better job in defending civil society activists, defending journalists. We've seen far too many attacks on civil society activists, uh, 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 firebombing of homes and other things, um, and, and cars. Uh, we, we need to see much greater accountability and justice here, including for what happened, by the way, in 2014, uh, which is all not that long ago. And what happened in 2014, of course, and this will bring me to the point that Ukraine faces to its national security from the biggest external threat, and that is Mr. Putin and his regime. Putin simply doesn't want Ukraine to succeed. He fears that a successful democratic market-oriented Ukraine will pose a threatening rival and alternative to the corrupt authoritarian system that he has put in place in Russia. And so he is trying to do everything he can to destabilize this. This obviously is not in Russia's national interest. Russia's national interest would be best served by having a thriving, prosperous, democratic Ukraine along its borders with whom it can trade, engage in all sorts of people-to-people -people contact, and build a, a better, more secure future for their respective populations. Mr. Putin's interests, however, are served by trying to destabilize Ukraine and having as much of an unstable neighbor along its borders as possible. He simply doesn't want an alternative country, an alternative model in a neighboring state that could pose a challenge to the system he has in place. The, the threat comes in, in, in many different forms. The most obvious and blatant is the military and security threat, which includes uh, occupation, the killing of Ukrainians, the, the arrests of 
of political prisoners, economic devastation in the East, the, the poverty in, in Crimea, um, violations of the latest ceasefire agreement from July 27th, in which just the other day one Ukrainian was killed. Um, we see uh, numerous violations of previous ceasefire agreements, not least, of course, the, the Minsk agreement that goes back to 2014. And in fact, the Minsk deal really has not worked. Uh, Russia is, is not taking it seriously at all. Russia tries to portray itself as a mediator rather than being seen as the guilty party, as the aggressor in this case, the, the violator of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, and we also have to be careful about the terms we use. We're not talking about a, a Ukraine crisis. We're not talking about separatism. We're talking about a Russian invasion of Ukraine and Russian forces or Russian proxies. It, it's not Ukrainian separatists. There was no separatist movement before. And Russia has tried to stir this up again to try to destabilize the situation inside Ukraine. The, the uh, Ukrainian ombudswoman just the other day reported that there are some 133 political prisoners being held uh, by Russia, including some 97 Crimean Tatars, whom we can't forget. They are paying a particularly brutal price uh, for Russia's occupation. But the threat comes in other forms as well. It comes in the form of disinformation, including through Russian-friendly media outlets in Ukraine, as well as Russian outlets that are able to penetrate into the Ukrainian media space. It includes political, again, with Russian-friendly political parties and useful idiots, frankly, in, in Ukraine who are serving Russia's interests, not Ukraine's interests. Corruption. This is another reason why Ukraine needs to get tougher and more serious about the fight in corruption. This is an area where Putin exploits. So the more corruption there is in Ukraine, the more openings there are for corrupt Russian actors to try to uh, increase their influence. Um, and then, of course, is the economic and energy side of things. And here I would highlight Nord Stream 2, which is a threat to Ukraine because it would remove several billions of dollars in transit fees from Ukraine if it were completed. And this is an area where I think uh, there needs to be much greater uh, attention and pressure on suspending and canceling the completion of Nord Stream 2. It's regrettable, in my view, that it has taken the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, a Russian opposition leader, for Germany to really start talking about suspending Nord Stream 2. Uh, it should have never been started in the first place, um, but at this point, whatever it takes, and I think Ukraine should weigh in at this point with German, with German officials and urge them to suspend this, whether it's for Navalny or other reasons, they're, they're really, this would do serious damage to, to Ukraine. Ukraine also needs to keep an eye on China. Uh, I know Secretary Pompeo was recently in touch with uh, Ukrainian officials, warning them about increasing Chinese economic penetration. And this is something where I think Ukraine should not view China as an alternative to Russia and try to counterbalance, but it needs to be more attentive that China's interests aren't necessarily going to uh, be mutual with Ukraine's interests. The, the role of the international community in the United States in particular is very important. And, and here, uh, it, it will be great if, if the Congress can confirm uh, General Dayton to get him out as a new U.S. ambassador. We have not had a, a fully confirmed ambassador since Ambassador Yovanovitch left. Uh, ambassador Taylor obviously did a great job during the time he was there, but he was pulled in, in the beginning of this year. So we need to get an ambassador in place to underscore the importance we attach to this relationship. Uh, we have to treat Ukraine as an ally, not as an enemy. And, and this is where the United States has had a bit of a schizophrenic approach in its policy, where on the one hand, the administration has provided very critical and necessary lethal military assistance, including uh, Javelin anti-tank missiles. Uh, but on the other hand, we see the rhetoric come from the president where he essentially treats Ukraine as, as an enemy to him, uh, having blamed it for the 2016 election. And members of Congress need to start stop uh, engaging in or facilitating, enabling Russian disinformation by uh, various investigations about what happened in 2016 as it relates to Ukraine. We, we also should be pressing for greater reform and more accountability. And there are a number of things that can be done in terms of national security assistance that can be provided 
Um, some of them I've already mentioned about Nord Stream 2. Sanctions uh, are, are critical. And, and here, the sanctions that have been in place for what Russia has done to Ukraine have not increased. They have stayed where they are. Now, some would say it's good because it was concerned that both the EU and the United States were going to lift these sanctions. The sanctions, in fact, should be increased. They need to be enhanced until Putin understands that the cost for continuing to occupy Ukraine, to continue his aggression against the country, outweigh any benefits that he might derive from this. And, and lastly, um, continued non-recognition of the annexation of Crimea and continued support for uh, the central government's efforts to reach out to the populations in Crimea and in the Donbass region to underscore that these remain Ukrainian citizens, despite what Russia might think. So let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. It's a, a very good analysis, and it's important for all of us to uh, tell everybody in the United States uh, and to remind them about Mr. Putin's overall strategy to uh, continue to disrupt the West, continue to cause problems, and Ukraine just is at the forefront of that. So Ukraine can't fight that battle by itself, as you said. They've got to have the, the help of the EU and, uh, and the United States. Uh, they can't fight that battle by themselves. And to destabilize the West is, is Mr. Putin's overall goal. Ukraine's just a part of that and his hybrid war. So this is a huge threat to uh, Ukraine uh, protecting its independence and strengthening its independence, probably no more uh, critical area. And as you said, we have to have a strong economy. We have to have strong democratic institutions in Ukraine, and particularly in this whole front of corruption. I'd like to say one week from today, we're going to have a webinar on corruption. We're going to have the, uh, the Ottomans and Business Council of Ukraine uh, whose whole job is to protect business, um, have a level playing field, help them solve problems, help reduce corruption. We're going to have a webinar with them to talk about corruption, talk about how to, Alexa, how to have a better playing field, have a, an improved environment, business environment. So we invite all of you to that. Uh, Roman, you've been Deputy Minister of Finance in Ukraine. You've been Deputy Minister of Economic Development. You've now been with the World Bank four years. So the ambassador talked about Ukraine's overall growth to become a strong nation. Alexa talked about the macroeconomics and how to get real companies to create real jobs. And David just talked about democracy building and uh, territory integrity. And now let's talk about the whole macroeconomic just seen, just seen the guy, what the World Bank is involved in, land reform and infrastructure development and all of those good things. So, Roman, uh, talk to us about uh, the macroeconomic development uh, uh, in Ukraine and uh, how you see that from your perspective of being with the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Economic Development, now the World Bank. Uh, thank you, Morgan, for, for this uh, invitation. And you remain probably the main platform for uh, U.S.-Ukraine cooperation for linking businesses. And almost also despite this COVID times, uh, you maintain uh, this active uh, link. Also, thank you, Ambassador, for uh, opening our panel and uh, close cooperation and, and support uh, in these challenging times. Alexa indeed did a very inspiring uh, introduction about the business's success uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine uh, despite uh, COVID and own limitations. And David provided this high-level political overview. Uh, so I, I would like to focus uh, on, on Ukraine and the bank cooperation and the overall macroeconomic uh, uh, environment that we are in. So... During the, the COVID in the past six months, the uh, government of Ukraine managed to maintain macrofiscal stability, and World Bank concluded it in uh, its most recent assessment in August. So they did pretty well. Uh, most of the forecasts, which were in uh, March, are now upgraded. Uh, uh, to some extent, World Bank will review its own forecast next month and will release it in uh, October. However, uh, despite uh, there's this positive signals, uh, several key risks remain and need to be addressed uh, for 
uh, Ukraine to continue a cooperation with World Bank, uh, IMF, uh, European Commission, and unlock financing, which is needed uh, by end of this calendar year. And uh, primarily, the key risks are in the anti-corruption policy. Um, uh, some uh, recent rulings, uh, uh, court rulings, uh, may reverse uh, the earlier achievement and uh, basically uh, be an obstacle for the future cooperation. The corporate governance uh, uh, and especially the salaries of the board members in the state-owned enterprises and state banks to ensure the independent corporate governance in the public sector uh, is, is important. Uh, for the World Bank, the land reform uh, remains a key priority. Uh, as we all know, Ukraine did a huge step forward in uh, its historic uh, opening the land market and adopting the land turnover law uh, back in, uh, uh, in April. And however, uh, to unlock, uh, to, to open the market successfully uh, in the mid of next year, uh, a set of measures, especially complementary legislation, uh, is required to ensure that uh, uh, people of Ukraine have uh, uh, financing access and necessary protection uh, for their property rights uh, on the land market. Uh, it's a la the whole roadmap and uh, especially the, the focus of it is the three uh, laws that needs to be approved uh, basically in the next couple of months uh, to stay in the timeline and have the market ready for opening in the mid next year. Uh, and obviously cooperation uh, with the IMF is essential for us, for the World Bank to continue financing. So by end of this year, uh, the World Bank reserved 1 billion financing to support the government uh, of Ukraine. Uh, 700 million out of uh, this 1 billion uh, structured uh, around the progress on the land reform uh, and success of its implementation. Uh, another 300 million uh, linked to support the unemployed and vulnerable people, and we expect uh, this financing to be approved by end of uh, November. Also, uh, the World Bank works across uh, other sectors in Ukraine, and uh, we have uh, right now five projects in the pipeline. Uh, for uh, this fiscal year. The fiscal year in the World Bank starts in July uh, and uh, ends in June. Uh, so then in the next, uh, in the upcoming uh, 11 uh, calendar months, we, we have another uh, billion to support Ukraine in various uh, sectors and specifically in the energy sector reform. It's uh, Ukrainergo building the uh, interconnector to connect the Ukrainian energy grid, electric energy grid with Europe. Uh, it's a project uh, to support the uh, independence and building the institutional capacity of newly created gas uh, transportation uh, operator. Uh, the project, the 100 million project to support the recovery of the East uh, and uh, also uh, support the infrastructure of uh, Ukrzaliznica. Uh, the total volume of uh, these projects uh, is 1 billion and uh, all the disbursements uh, of the projects uh, are linked to a broader reform in, in each of this sector. These projects are on uh, top of the existing 2.5 billion portfolio, which World Bank now implements uh, in Ukraine. And the disbursements uh, occur basically every month as uh, we progress with, with the reforms. Uh, IFC stands ready to, to support the private sector. Uh, we created, a, and the municipalities, uh, we created a facility which basically allowed all existing clients to scale up uh, their financing as they may need uh, the, the, uh, to increase liquidity during the, the COVID, uh, uh, to respond to COVID. Uh, we work closely with municipalities, specifically in Lviv, uh, in Zaporizhia, uh, Mariupol, uh, to support the municipal uh, infrastructure development. Alexa mentioned about the PPP project. Uh, after Ukraine successfully uh, adopted the new legislation uh, for concession law, uh, that basically enabled uh, uh, two deals uh, uh, in the poor, in in the infrastructure, uh, specifically two seaport concessions, where IFC advised the Ukrainian government 
to create the whole legal framework and to support the bidding process, which ultimately led to concluding two, two deals. And we are working more with municipalities and with the Ministry of Economy to create more deals, uh, uh, more private, uh, public-private sector uh, transactions. Uh, World Bank uh, remain, uh, remains committed to Ukraine and maintains a close dialogue. On Monday, the Minister of Finance, uh, Marchenko, will meet with the President uh, of the World Bank, David uh, Malpas. It's uh, going to be virtually together with uh, other 13 ministries of our uh, constituency. Uh, unfortunately, the bank itself uh, uh, remain on the remote work and the, the missions uh, to Ukraine are only uh, virtually. Uh, our new country director uh, who assumed position in May uh, is still in Washington, but he is in a close contact uh, with us and uh, with the government of Ukraine, basically, to support, uh, to support the country. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, Ambassador, uh, we all know that probably the uh, most powerful organization in the United States uh, uh, who understands that Mr. Putin's battle is uh, against the West, to destabilize the West, and that Ukraine is a major part of that in the front lines right now, is Capitol Hill, the U.S. Congress. They seem to get the bigger picture. They seem to understand what the larger strategy is of Mr. Putin. You, part of your major job is to keep the Capitol Hill in, uh, uh, in, in, there in Washington informed about what's going on and talk to them about Ukraine and its battle for territory integrity. Any comments from you, Mr. Ambassador, about how you look at the U.S. Congress moving forward uh, to help Ukraine become a stronger nation? Mr. Ambassador. Well, thank you, Morgan. This is a really important topic. Uh, I think this is the most precious uh, part of the Ukrainian-American partnership and friendship. Uh, I, I mean, the position of the US Congress. Uh, the strong uh, bipartisan and bicameral support, uh, as I always say, is not something which uh, you know started a couple of years ago. If I'm, if I remember correctly, even during the Soviet times, thanks to the Ukrainian diaspora in the United States, first of all, the position of the US Congress was always uh, in favor of Ukraine's independence. Maybe it was not as much outspoken as right now, of course, but I remember even in the 80s, uh, in spite of the famous uh, Chikan Alakiev speech by, by former President Bush, in the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, uh, when he called uh, 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 on Ukraine uh, not to disengage from the Soviet Union, from Russia, and, and to remain the part of the bigger, bigger country. This speech was criticized not only in Ukraine, but also was uh, strongly criticized uh, in the US Congress. That was, I think, at the end of 1991. Uh, and uh, this support, this uh, bipartisan support still exists. It's, it's getting better and bigger with every year. We appreciate very much the, the recent decision, uh, uh, or, or the draft, uh, which was introduced uh, uh, in August, uh, which for the first time foresees uh, the military and security and financial support for Ukraine during the next five years. Uh, and, and every year the figure may, may even grow. Uh, by the way, uh, since 2014, thanks to the position of the Congress as well, Ukraine has received uh, more than $2 billion in military and security support, which is... Uh, more than 92% of, of all military support uh, and security support given to Ukraine by, by the rest of the world. And, uh, uh, well, of course, the, the COVID-19 and the quarantine uh, makes uh, our, our work with the Congress uh, you know, much more difficult. I mean, there is no physical contact, of course, but we continue 
very active dialogue. Uh, there's regular communication. Uh, we supply the, uh, uh, the members of the Congress uh, almost daily with the uh, very relevant, uh, important information uh, on Ukraine, uh, on what happens there, on the course of reforms, on the security situation in the East, around Crimea, virtually everything which is important for them to know uh, and to use it in their work. Uh, I'm uh, in regular you know, phone contacts with a number of, uh, of senators and members of the Congress uh, on the different issues. And, and we appreciate uh, you know, very much that you know, even, even during the COVID time, even during the difficult period for the United States uh, you know, themselves, uh, even uh, under the condition when the Congress has to pay a lot of attention, you know, to the internal, well, to the economic situation in the country, uh, to the assistance, uh, all those things. Even even during this time, they they are still able to devote a lot of their time and effort to help and to support Ukraine. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it behooves all of us to work very closely with the ambassador. Uh, we had some meetings uh, in February of all the groups in Washington interested in Ukraine with the ambassador about how to improve and expand our work on uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, David, you've met with lots of congressmen and senators throughout your, your, your career when you were at Freedom House and when you were at the State Department. A few comments from you. How do we do a better job to tell Congress and the senators the Ukraine story and what's really going on over there with Mr. Putin? David, any quick comments about how we do a better job with Congress and the senators? Well, I, I, I would echo what the ambassador said, which is there is strong bipartisan support in the Congress for Ukraine. Uh, this is not a partisan issue when it comes to the House of the Senate, fortunately. Um, and I, I think the work that U.S.-Ukraine Business Council does, the U.S.-Ukraine uh, uh, Foundation, um, uh, the uh, Ukrainian Congress Committee of, of America, all, all, these, all these organizations, I think, are doing a, a, an excellent job. It is particularly difficult right now, given the pandemic and the inability to meet, at least on a regular basis, in person. Um, hearings are much harder to do, although they are possible. And I think to the extent that there could be uh, growing uh, encouragement for Congress to host hearings on what Russia is doing to Ukraine, what Mr. Putin is doing to Ukraine more specifically, um, I, I think the better because the situation in Belarus had the world's attention for a while. That already seems to have dissipated, even though the protests continue in Belarus. I worry that the attention focused on Ukraine could also dissipate, but at least it, it seems in the appropriations process, <clears throat> there will continue to be strong support for funding Ukraine to help it defend itself against Mr. Putin's invading forces. Uh, Marcy Kaptur and some other congressmen just released a statement about Belarus. And part of it was the fact that they understand it could have negative effects upon Ukraine. We worked very closely with Marcy Kaptur on economic development and some others. So, uh, Alexa, you and I, you called me one time and said, let's do a meeting on Capitol Hill about business investment. Uh, maybe we ought to do one of those again. It's important to Capitol Hill understand that it's in our economic and business interest for to be the strong Ukraine. And there's many, many opportunities for U.S. companies to be involved in Ukraine that... Uh, where they're still kind of sitting on the sidelines. So uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, I always said that one of the best ways to tell the U.S. Congress uh, about the importance of American business is to show them all the logos of Boeing and Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and Lilly and uh, all the major U.S. companies that are involved over in Ukraine. There's several hundred of them uh, involved in Ukraine and the Congress doesn't really know as much involvement and it's a huge agricultural market. And right now, of course, the World Bank and uh, through your group, Alexa, amazing progress in agribusiness this year. The agricultural production has stayed up. Money almost every week being announced for port development, 
railroad development, infrastructure, and the president of Ukraine is committed to build a lot better roads in Ukraine, which is all important for uh, moving agriculture uh, ahead very rapidly and to getting more U.S. companies involved. It's amazing how much U.S. farm equipment, crop protection supplies, seeds, and other things go into uh, helping develop in Ukraine. So it's kind of an untold story. So we all got to do more to be able to tell the U.S. Congress and the U.S. administration about the importance uh, of Ukraine to uh, the economic and export to development of uh, the United States. Let's now turn to Michael Dotsenko, uh, one of my colleagues in Ukraine, and who's been kind of monitoring some of the questions. Uh, Michael, do you have some questions? Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I certainly do. Um, first, we had one uh, coming by email from Anders Aslund. Uh, Dr. Aslund with Atlantic Council wanted to know, uh, and I'm going to readdress it to uh, Mr. Pivsky because Mr. Petrashko is not available. Uh, the question is about the cap on the salaries of members of management boards and supervisory boards of SOEs, uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, when uh, will uh, when will this issue be addressed? What's going on with that? Thank you very much, Anders, for that question. I, I appreciate it. And unfortunately, I'm not in a position to speak for the minister of the min or the ministry on this. Uh, it's not within my remit. But I do know that they are very aware of this concern and they are working on it. And I would be happy to. Um, to get back to you, Anders, via phone or email to, to have a more in-depth conversation on this following um, a discussion with the minister. So please do be in touch. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one is from Mr. Stefan Vasilko from SDW Consulting. And I think it's also more for Alexa than for anybody else. Uh, what is the current status of Ukraine's national export strategy under Zelensky administration? My remit for the minister is to work with U.S. investors, investors basically in places outside of Ukraine, to educate and inform them about opportunities in Ukraine. So all of my work has really been uh, Western-based, outside of Ukraine, working with new investors, um, helping the government in their strategy to catch this unique moment, this unique opportunity in history when following COVID, you know, global, globally, companies are looking to create their, um, it's this buzzword I've been hearing, their China plus one policy in terms of manufacturing, in terms of supply chains. They're looking to diversify their, their plans and build resiliency into their supply chains. So my work has been focused with this. I haven't been working with the export promotion office at all. Um, again, I would be happy to connect you to the right people to answer your question. Um, but we have been, you know, I'm, I'm working with um, multiple potential investors, mainly here in the United States from ammunition manufacturers to a multi-billion dollar US-based auto entity looking to engage with Ukrainian tech all the way to a Hollywood film production company. And we've had some exciting, positive, promising talks with them and um, look forward to bringing some of these deals to fruition. We do know that the Deputy Minister of Economic Development is in Spain this week. Uh, uh, he's a trade ambassador. He's working on increasing the trade. We know that there's a lot of work going on in increasing agricultural trade and uh, uh, exports is a, is a major, and we plan to do a webinar later this fall on Ukraine being a part of the international supply chain. That's very critical. Uh, Alexa has worked on that, of how to get Ukraine more involved in doing contracts with international companies to be a part of the supply chain for Europe and the United States, which will substantially increase exports. Let's keep the questions for the minister and write them up and get them to Alexa and get them to the minister uh, uh, at an appropriate time. Uh, Michael, another question? Uh, certainly, next one is from uh, Tamara Denisenko uh, from, uh, Rochester, uh, from uh, Ukrainian Federal Credit Union. Um, and uh, the question is uh, about uh what kind of support uh is ukraine thinking about for uh 
the credit unions uh, in Ukraine uh, for uh, consumer needs, for farmers, for business enterprises, uh, as well as for government employees, uh, like is the case in the United States. Uh, currently in Ukraine, there are only 78 uh, credit unions uh, with uh, about half a million members. And in the United States, about one third of the population uh, is involved in a credit union of some sort. So uh, maybe it's uh, uh, more to uh, Roman Kachur. Uh, maybe Ambassador Yeltsin can know something about those ideas. Um, to be happy fair, to, to, to take. take. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a big expert in that, uh, uh, although I remember well and I. I know well uh, that uh, you know this is a traditional form of, of cooperation between uh, the Ukrainians and and actually the Ukrainian immigration to the United States has started around 100 years ago from creating you know this sort of uh, cooperatives or credit unions. But of course, Roman is is much better, uh, much more familiar with the policies in Ukraine because I know how it. Uh, 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 it is being implemented here in the U.S., but I have no idea on on on, on whether it is uh, it has any perspective in Ukraine. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, you Ambassador, Ambassador, for, for, for the, the, just, just a moment. moment. I have double, double connection, connection. Uh, for for this uh, intro. Indeed, Ukraine has a long history of. Uh, uh, working and having the credit unions uh, probably uh, a couple of centuries. Uh, but uh, in the recent uh, modern history, uh, unfortunately, the credibility of credit unions was undermined because of lack of supervision. And uh, last year in fall, uh, Ukraine approved a new split law, which basically brought the uh, supervision of the uh, financial institutions, including the credit union, under the central bank. That uh, strengthens the supervision and uh, the uh, and oversight on on the sector, and created the whole roadmap for development of uh, non-banking financial institutions, including the, the credit union. Uh, so basically, the the sector is uh, is now recreated, and there are a lot of opportunities as we observe in U.S. and other countries. Uh, it's a huge niche. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, non-banking financial institutions to to fill in, uh, and also in in Ukraine. So we the, the perspective is uh, quite good, but uh, the sector will is uh, is being recreated. So I welcome any opportunities to cooperate, and obviously the World Bank and uh, uh, its uh, private sector arm uh, IFC will be happy to to support and is actually now supporting the reforms in the uh, finance sector. I want to move to David Kramer real quickly. David, you mentioned uh, freedom of the press. We all know one of the strong pillars and an absolute pillar to all free democratic nations is freedom of the press. There seems to be some setbacks in Ukraine and uh, we know what happens to some of the national bank people. And uh, as you said, a house gets burned down. People get murdered and threatened. Uh, David, uh, that's of great concern to the, all of us who want a stronger, independent Ukraine is to have an attack on freedom of the press. What do you think can be done? What do you think uh, the international community needs to speak up more? What can be done? Uh, doesn't seem like there's being enough done very few people are being prosecuted. Very few cases are being solved. Uh, this freedom of the press area is very critical. David? I think the tone needs to be set at the top, Morgan. And, and that means President Zelensky needs to make this a priority. And the uh, investigators and the prosecutors also need to make this a priority because in the absence of any accountability, in the absence of any uh, closure of any of these cases, there will be more cases and, and more people will be injured or their property will be destroyed or tragically they might get killed. So it's critically important that from the president on down, the signal is sent that these kinds of attacks on journalists or civil society activists for that matter, um, or, or people in the opposition are, are unacceptable. And when they say unacceptable, they actually do something about it. 
the international community can certainly apply pressure. I'll be honest, the United States needs to approach this issue with a little more humility than perhaps we did in the past, given some of the comments made by the president accusing the American press of being enemies of the people, uh, a phrase that is all too familiar in this part of the world. Um, but I, I think there's no question that there needs to be more attention focused on these things. Otherwise, we're going to see more of them. The, 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 press, the press act is a, is a fundamental uh, pillar of society as a counterbalance, as a check and, uh, check and balance on any abuses of government or other, other officials. And so we, Ukraine needs to understand, and I'm sure it does, but needs to do more in protecting journalists because they are a key ingredient to democratic development. We all know what happens when... Uh... Uh, the people want to take over a country. They want to stay in power, just like in Belarus. There's been a major attack on the journalists there. Uh, and we, we read about it every day, almost every week. There's a major attack on journalists somewhere around the world from those who do not want strong nations, those who do, do not want a democracy. So we got, yeah, I think we ought to urge uh, United States, Europe, and Ukraine to uh, be more strong to stronger to speak out and to really uh, investigate these cases and and uh, bring some to conclusions because most of them do not uh, are brought to conclusion they just kind of disappear and nothing happens uh, that doesn't uh, stand as a strong deterrent to uh, tax upon uh, uh, freedom of the press. Uh, Michael Dotsenko, do you have another question? Um, most certainly. Um, I think this is probably also for Mr. Kramer. Uh, Mr. Michael Balahutrak from uh, Houston, Texas is asking, how can U.S. citizens in USA put greater pressure on the U.S. government to take stronger actions against Russian invasion and to build stronger ties with Ukraine? Uh, you mentioned uh, Ukrainian Congressional Caucus uh, Association, some other organizations uh, to which his comment is, uh, what about here in Houston? Uh, Texas does not have good response to Ukraine issues, and all those associations are on the East Coast. Uh, well, I think I'll jump in and say there's an honorary uh, consul of Ukraine in Houston, Texas, but uh, um, maybe Mr. Ambassador and maybe Mr. Kramer. I'll let the ambassador go first, please. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, I can start from saying that we are uh, at the very final stage of opening the new, the fourth or the fifth, actually, General Consulate of Ukraine uh, in the United States uh, in Houston. Uh, we already uh, agreed on the premises. Uh, now is being uh, um, so qualified by the State Department. We need to get a, to get a clearance. Uh, from the U.S. State Department, uh, and as soon as it happens, probably by the end of this month, by the end of, of September, we will uh, formally start the work of the uh, of the new general consulate in Houston. The uh, new consul general is already appointed. He is sitting and waiting in Kiev. We're in touch with him and uh, his relatively small team. There will be two or three more. Uh, diplomats, and uh, we're very hopeful that, uh, in combination with the work of of our honorary consul, whom this we respect a lot, he spent uh, around 20 years uh, in this role, and he was quite successful in spreading information about Ukraine. But of course, having the the official uh, consulate general is is much more instrumental and and besides we are also very hopeful that uh, this uh, new uh, you know, consulate will also help us to develop the, the the business ties because Texas is a very important state uh, in sense of energy uh, high tech uh, uh, all other kinds of industries and and we hope that uh, the this consulate will be very active uh, in developing the business links between Ukraine and the United States. All right, let's go back to Alexa for just a minute. Alexa, the, the uh, 
Davos, Ukraine Davos House has been very important to tell the story of Ukraine. I think, you, uh, what are your plans this year? You're going to be doing uh, some events uh, online, virtual. Uh, how are we going to keep that momentum of the Ukraine and Davos House going to uh, tell the story to major businesses about Ukraine? Thank you, Morgan, for that question. Um, we are in discussions about it now. Uh, very recently, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, did announce that they will not be holding their traditional meeting in January, as per usual. They themselves are working with some sort of online virtual variant. Um, they're hoping to do it in person next summer. That's their goal. We will see. But in the meantime, we are having internal discussions about that now. Okay, well, we thank you for all the great work and uh, we know that uh, you'll do everything you can to continue that, uh, that work, which is uh, very critical again, uh, because Ukraine is not going to uh, be able to solve all these economic problems by themselves and there's not enough of domestic investment. So we're gonna have to continue uh, with international investment. Michael, is there another question? Uh, Morgan, perhaps we should go back to Mr. Kramer because uh, he did not uh, uh, provide any information <laughs> in addition sure, to what let the me, let me just said. Thanks, Michael. Um, let me just quickly add to what the ambassador said. Um, it's not just the Ukrainian embassies and its various consulates' uh, responsibility to try to raise awareness. It's incumbent upon all of us, um, uh, NGOs, uh, various foundations, business councils, and analysts. Um, sometimes there is a tendency just to stick to the East Coast, and there is a whole big country out there here in the United States, and we need to understand that it's important to raise awareness in other parts of the country so that they in turn might use their growing awareness to raise these issues with their members of Congress, with their senators. Um, so I think, I think some of us need to do a better job of reaching out to various parts. I, I saw Jessica Blazer um, indicating an interest to connect um, with, the, with the questioner about this, about some of the work that, she, that she's doing. Um, so there are, there are a number of organizations out there that can also fill in. This needs to be sort of a public-private partnership, if you will, where it's not just the Ukrainian embassy that's doing this, but it needs to be uh, a number of, of organizations that want to see a, a better Ukraine working together. Uh, Roman, uh, as you know, business like stability. Business likes to know uh, kind of that there's going to be uh, uh, some rules that uh, we kind of know what they're in and they're not always changing. There's been a lot of uh, upset the fruit basket, changing positions in the government, uh, changing positions at the National Bank. Uh, and uh, there's rumors that there's going to be some more. This is very uh, concerning to the business community for the future of building Ukraine. Uh, I know the IMF, the World Bank and others, EU and lots of international financial organizations have spoken out about some of the instability and not knowing exactly what the new people are going to bring or why it was necessary to have all of this instability. Any comments from you about uh, stability in the economic area and particularly economic officials in this new government and its impact upon the future development of Ukraine? Uh, thank you, Morgan. Indeed, stability is very important. And uh, unfortunately, this year, Ukraine had three ministers of finance, two governors of the central bank. And I hope uh, there will be no more changes uh, anytime soon as the stability and continuity is extremely important to keep the commitment with uh, international financial institutions and all other partners. Uh, as you know, uh, the central bank uh, change of the governor was... Uh, uh, perceived well by the not perceived well, but the, the new selection selected person was perceived well uh, by the market. Uh, Ukraine went uh, and placed a two billion uh, uh, historically high volume of the euro bonds uh, to secure financing and roll roll over other. But uh, till the year end, uh, it's crucially important to maintain cooperation and to, to fulfill commitments and to, to do this. Uh, the continuity of, of the current team is, is very important. Uh, as the 
uh, risks are building up and uh, the measures needs to be taken to, to preserve the stability, uh, which the government did rather well in the past six, six months. It's interesting, Alexa, that uh, Ukraine has been a leader in IT and uh, domestically and uh, international companies buying IT companies in Ukraine and exports. It is very interesting that uh, the one area where Belarus has been most successful is in that big uh, park that they developed uh, that has thousands of IT companies in it. It's very interesting, the United States. Ukraine was moving forward to say, uh, let's get a bunch of those to move to Ukraine. Let's set up a big IT park in Ukraine, and they're going to bring in uh, two or three of the specialists and know how to build those big IT uh, special parks uh, to Ukraine. That sounds very promising uh, to uh, uh, reverse the brain train and bring in a lot of people that went to Belarus and bring them back to Ukraine and set up some of the special uh, features for IT companies that they have in uh, Minsk and bring them back to Ukraine. That sounds like a good, uh, a good move uh, to, uh, to strengthen the IT sector in, in Ukraine. So Mike, Michael, is there one final question then before we get some final comments from everyone? Um, Mr. Jim Slattery um, has been holding his hand and now typed in the question. Uh, what can be done to encourage natural gas development in Ukraine? Uh, and well, he's got two questions. Uh, he's also concerned about Chinese and Russian interests trying to buy Ukrainian aerospace industry and what should be the appropriate response from the West. So natural gas and uh, aerospace. Well, I think I'll probably take that. Uh, Ukraine has been slow to develop their energy, as you know. Uh, production sharing program is on hold. Nothing's happened for 12 months. That's held back uh, oil and gas uh, development. Um, the United States, of course, has spoken out about being careful about Chinese domination. So I think that's a good uh, topic. Uh, we, we, we plan to have a webinar on on energy development, but particularly gas and oil, uh, and there's been way too many state monopolies. We're glad that the uh, government of Ukraine has just recently announced, I think again, that they're going to increase the privatization uh, and the sale of state companies, which has uh, been a big uh, bastion of corruption and fraud and uh, patting people's pockets. Uh, they had some this, the hotel successful privatization, but they need a lot more. So we got to continue to uh, put the pressure on Ukraine to develop their energy and uh, to open it up to international companies and uh, to get rid of these all these uh, corrupt state uh, companies and get them into the private sector. That's a way to substantially reduce uh, the level of corruption. So now let's uh, move into some final comments. And uh, Roman, let's start with you. Any final comments from you about building Ukraine as a stronger, more viable nation? Indeed. Uh, uh, thank you, Morgan. Uh, uh, econo economic independence probably is a cornerstone of the whole Ukrainian independence. And Ukraine uh, has done a, a tremendous uh, effort and success uh, in the past five years uh, moving towards the West and then creating new markets. We, we heard about all this success in the energy sector and uh, uh, promoting reform, the, the developing the infrastructure, the agri sector. So uh, there is a, a, a crucial need to continue those efforts and to, to continue to unlock uh, the land reform, uh, to promote uh, investment, to, to continue opening other markets and allow more foreign direct investments while uh, maintaining the close cooperation with all IFIs. So I hope that uh, certain issues, that uh, outstanding issues that now exist will be addressed in the couple, next couple of months and uh, Ukraine will prosper as indeed uh, um, it, it managed to build uh, quite a this stable uh, macro environment uh, despite all the external challenges uh, we, which are around globally. Thank you. 
Alexa, we expect you to be involved in helping build a stronger, more viable nation in Ukraine for at least 30 more years. Your comments about what all you plan for the next 30 years to help build Ukraine. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan, for having us today. It's been an interesting conversation. I'd just like to emphasize this uh, strategy that the ministry is working on, Ukraine Invest is working on, the government is working on. Dan Bielak wrote an excellent article on it. This was already at the outbreak of COVID uh, several months ago. But this idea of Ukraine positioning itself as the new Eurasian supply chain nexus, which it has the cap capacity to do. You think of geography, it sits at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. It's incredibly talented and skilled workforce, competitive costs, manufacturing expertise. I mean, I would just like to add that Ukraine really has the ability to become the Guangxi province of the EU. It's an overnight drive to the EU retail outlet. So uh, we look forward to working on this concept. Uh, separately, the, I know the minister very much looks forward to communicating and engaging with you. Um, he really appreciates this two-way communication. And as such, he's uh, set up an email address. So please email us your comments, your questions, and I will be delighted to stay in touch with you. That email address is ministryofeconomy at me.gov.ua. Again, that's ministryofeconomy at me.gov.ua. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you very much, Alexa. We talked about keeping the West Coast involved in Ukraine and Texas. We want you to know David is in charge of Florida, keeping Florida involved in Ukraine. <laughs> and even though he's parked down there in Florida, he's still involved uh, in the United States and the world all the time. So, uh, David, thank you. Uh, uh, we expect to hear a lot more from Florida. But fi your final comments about how we're going to build a much stronger and viable nation in Ukraine. Oh, I'm offended, Morgan, that you, <clears throat> you didn't ask me about my next 30 years of involvement on this. But I guess at my age, that's understandable. Um, look, I, I would say uh, at the risk of sounding like a cliche, these are incredibly challenging times that we're all living through uh, with the pandemic. Uh, but for Ukraine in particular, these are challenging times because you have a neighbor that has invaded you and that is occupying part of your territory. So I hope any criticism that you hear coming from the West, in particular from the United States, is taken in the spirit of friendship. We are far from perfect, as we've been proving a little all too frequently lately. And we need to approach any, any criticism and pushback with a strong dose of humility. But do understand that coming from the United States, we do this in the spirit of friendship. We want to see Ukraine succeed. This is a bipartisan issue with bipartisan support. Um, but for Ukraine, the need to stay on the right path is made even more urgent by the threat that you face from Mr. Putin. So uh, I hope that Ukraine stays on the right path because that'll be important not only for Ukraine first and foremost, but it will be important for all of us because Ukraine is a frontline state. And if Ukraine can succeed, then it means virtually any country in, the, in that region can succeed, including hopefully one day Russia itself. Oh, thank you very much, David. Before we move to the ambassador, I just want to say on behalf of the business community, Ukraine is a very important country. It's a very serious country. And for all of us, Nothing more important than helping build Ukraine as a strong and viable nation for the people of Ukraine, for the region, for the world, and for the United States. And let's never forget that those that don't want Ukraine to be a strong and viable nation, they're very well organized. They're very effective. They play hardball. They have uh, more money than you'd ever know what to do with. So let's never forget that those who fight against democracy, who fight against freedom, who fight against private business, who fight against the territorial integrity of Ukraine. They're strong. They're major factors. They're not to be taken for granted. And so we have to fight every day. We have to fight with the best that we have. And we have to do a better job to fight for the future for, uh, for Ukraine. So now, Mr. Ambassador, thank you again for being with us. Your final comments about building Ukraine as a strong and viable nation as we move forward. Well, uh, 
First of all, thank you once again. Thank you all of you for, for making this event possible. And I'm already looking forward to have even more webinars uh, and, and uh, you know, different events uh, on Ukraine. Uh, secondly, uh, although I should have started from that, I think that Ukraine's future, well, of course, it depends uh, almost entirely uh, on the Ukrainian people, but it also depends on the continuing assistance and friendship with the United States. Uh, I think I uh, already said this several times that there is more uh, there is no greater friend of Ukraine than the United States and the world. And uh, uh, the other way around, they, uh, I think there is no greater friend of the United States than Ukraine. Although, of course, we're not able to, to give to the United States as much as we receive from them. But uh, it is crucial, the assistance of the United States uh, during this extremely difficult period for Ukraine is essential and crucial. And I'm very hopeful that after we overcome the, the consequences of pandemics and, and uh, uh, hopefully after the presidential elections in the United States, uh, our bonds will uh, grow even stronger. We're very thankful to the US government for, for their support. We're very thankful for the uh, US-Ukrainian Business Council for uh, pressing Ukraine. We appreciate that. You should continue your pressure in order to uh, get rid of uh, corruption entirely in Ukraine, in order to, uh, to increase the uh, level of trust. Uh, because when we say about the need for more US and other Western investments of Ukraine, we should understand that uh, this is the homework for Ukraine, first of all. And, and thanks for the, uh, for the efforts of, of uh, US Business Council, Ukraine US Business Council, uh, we're able to do this homework even better. So thank you again. Thank you to the United States and, and let's continue our cooperation in order to, to make Ukraine you know, greater and, and better. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for all the panelists. Thank you for all those who tuned in today. You've heard the challenges. You've heard the, uh, some of the things that need to be done. Uh, this is very important. It's very critical. We have to fight and we have to fight hard and we have to fight professionally and fight effectively. So let's all continue to recommit ourselves to fighting for a stronger and more viable Ukraine in the years ahead. And as we say at the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, let's move full speed ahead. Thank you very much. See you next week.